Hello. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Lisa and my presentation is called A Gente Costura, Instant Improvised Interventions. So uh, A Gente Costura in Portuguese has a triple entendre. Costura means sewing and A Gente translates into the people and it's also a colloquial term for us, uh, the collective, and A Gente translates into agent, a force or substance that causes a change. So uh, we are a sewing agent. The video in the background is footage from my latest performance, Fashion Orchestra, um, from a camera that I wear around my neck. Um, fashion Orchestra was a very intense learning experience. It was my biggest performance to date, and my aim was to involve all the artists that have ever invited me into their shows. I was the artistic director and maestro to coordinate everybody. The idea for the show was mine, but all of the collaborators helped in shaping the show. Um, I designed the structure, and then all of the 30 people involved um, all had their own individual input into the work. In the article, one place after another, Miwan Kwan points to an aesthetics of administration explaining that the situation now demands a different set of verbs to negotiate, to coordinate, to compromise, to research, to promote, to organize, which can all be seen as aspects of my role in fashion orchestra. On top of all of that, I was also performing in the show. Um, my practice began in 2003 in Curitiba, Brazil, uh, where the, with the exhibitions in progress. I would set up a sewing machine in unexpected places such as coffee shops, restaurants, and nightclubs, inviting the public to experience and engage with the transformation of clothing. In 2009, I opened the doors to the garage, my artist studio and shop, where I work as an upcycler. In the garage, I also began promoting art shows, fashion shows, and music shows. This is where musical sewing was born, out of the interactions with other artists. At first, I was invited by musicians to collaborate on their shows, and after starting in this program, I began creating my own performances. For example, at Instant Coffee last summer intensive and Fashion Orchestra. This is the practice that I brought into the program, to use the sewing machine as a musical instrument in collaborative performances, altering clothes to the beat of the music. My work can be defined within two instances, the studio work and the on-stage work. The on-stage performance is a semi-scripted version of what happens in the studio. In the garage, I have created a space where the viewer becomes participant by bringing their clothing to be transformed. This is done through a process of trying on the garments and having a dialogue as to why that particular garment does not suit them anymore. I will then come up with alternatives in shaping that garment. This creates an intimate, interhuman relation. I am aiming to define my practice within the history of performance art. Starting with the Dadaists and the Cabaret Voltaire, which was a space for artists to come together and perform. A lot of the times, pushing the limits of the audience. They were really interested in shocking and anti-art um, in order to discuss the social-political context at the turn of the 20th century. This in turn influenced New York-based artists in the 1960s, um, for example, Al Capro and the idea of happenings um, in his aim of the blurring of art and life. Uh, Brazilian artist Edu Oitzica uh, was in New York at the time and he brought these ideas back into the Brazilian context in the, his works of the Parabolés, where there were um, textile sculptures that were meant to be worn, and he was working with um, carnival artists and samba and a very huge general context. Um, so within a contemporary 
art discourse, I have focused my research on Nicolas Bourriot's theory on relational aesthetics to try and stitch all of this into my practice. Uh, Bourriot mentions more contemporary artists working in the 1990s in this idea of relational art. For example, Felix gonzalez um, where he would set up a room full of candies, and people could come in and take that candy, the candy, um, and recreate Teravania, um, which is set up a social space with a fridge full of drinks and invite the viewers in the gallery to just have a dialogue. Um, so, uh, Boryod writes, the role of the artwork is no longer to form imaginary and utopian realities, but to actually be ways of living and models of action within the existing real. The artist dwells in the circumstances the present offers him so as to turn the settings of his life, his links with the physical and conceptual world, into a lasting world. So in entering the program, I began to explore my work more critically, and I created a diagram to explain the performance work using my instrument, the sewing machine. I will use this mechanism to explain the aspects of my current practice. So, um, the school of thread uh, represents the audience, um, as they encounter the work, and they are threaded through the machine, um, each point representing an aspect of my work. So, um, as well as learning about my methodology, you will all learn how to thread a sewing machine. Um, so it goes here, uh, and the first thread guide is the venue. So this brings up a discussion on site specificity, and as Juan writes, Locations contribute a specific identity to the shows staged by injecting into the experience the uniqueness of the place. So whether in a gallery or a traditional theater or out on the street in front of my studio, the work will take on a different format. But ultimately, um, I'm trying to get the experience from the studio um, to relate to the place where it is, to really inhabit that space, which is the next thread guide. Um, in Fashion Orchestra, I explored the idea um, of tying elastic bands around the space. Um, they were tied around the structures of the theater, and the performers were tying them during the performance as part of the actions to create a web-like structure around and over the stage and around the audience. The elastics um, relate to the idea um, of the rhizome, uh, in reference to Deleuze and Guattari, um, and these authors emphasize how knowledge construction is not linear, but it intersects and grows in this rhizomatic um, idea. And the elastics can also be, might also be interpreted as a physical link to the concept of these interrelations that I am proposing. there, um, which is the concept of upcycling. So the political aspect of my work um, discusses our current consumption habits, most especially um, in a critique of the fashion industry. Um, so I can't say this for certain in Canada, but most people in Brazil, when they buy a garment, they aren't really thinking about where the gar garments came from, how it was constructed, and at what cost. They think about this even less when they dispose of garments every new season just to be in fashion. Um, the industry leads the public to consume more and more by making products of very little quality that basically disintegrate within a few washes. And then they change the colors that are in season or the lengths of the skirts just to get people to buy more. So the book uh, Cradle to Cradle, William McDonald and Michael Bromgard explain how there's a crucial difference between recycling and upcycling. Recycling means to break down the materials of a product to make other products. Often, new products are of lesser quality than the original. Upcycling is a refashioning of the same materials, achieving a product of the same quality or better. Within the context of the fashion industry today, upcycling comes as an alternative to the fast fashion industry. Um, according to James LeVere, fast fashion has been coined to describe low-priced, fashion-forward clothes sold on the high street. 
In Britain, it has been estimated that in 2011, the average woman has around four times as many clothes as her counterpart owned in 1980. This result is that more and, uh, more and more energy, materials, and labor resources are being expended and the landfills are brimming over. So, um, even though it looks like it's all a lot of fun, uh, it's not just about having fun. Um, which brings us to the tension discs um, that represent the performative actions of uh, the performances. Um, and each sewing machine has a different tension disc which controls the right tension for the thread to go through the machine and produce the stitch. So this is very important in getting a stitch. If, this is a, if it's not the right tension, you don't get the right result. Um, which also, in the performances, in a way, um, each performance has different performers um, for each um, different occasion. So, um, at first I was interested only in the actions of myself as a seamstress, like cutting and pinning and sewing, um, but then in fashion orchestra we started exploring di some different of these performative actions, like cutting hair and layering these performative actions. So a musician would be playing the flute and she would be getting her hair done. And the idea is really to just bring on stage everything that's normally backstage to get ready for the show during the show. Um, this is really like the actual tension part of the performance because I'm really exploring the idea of real time. Um, Going, breaking with the tradition of theater where everything is staged and the viewer is supposed to forget himself and be put into somebody else's position. This is all happening live in real time and the participants are also invited to physically interact with what's going on. So as Kwan writes, a dominant drive of site-oriented practice today is the pursuit of a more intense engagement with the outside world and everyday life. After we go through the tension, um, there is this little lever here that goes up and down. It makes the needle go up and down. So we go through here, and this represents the music part of the song, of the musical song. Um, so it really is the score to the to the performances. And music is such a rich example of creating these social relationships. Um, I've been experimenting with the sounds of the sewing machine, the sounds that I can make um, in a percussive sense, so I'm adding other elements like bells and things to the machine that are activated as I'm sewing. Um, so in a way, uh, we can say that I've actually upcycled the sewing machine um, by recontextualizing it. Uh, John Cage is a very big influence in, the, in my work uh, as he uses objects that are normally not seen as instruments in a musical way um, and also in the improvisational characteristics of his work um, and improvisation is our next thread guide and all of these little guys are very very important to make the sewing machine actually produce a stitch if anything is not really in place then it just simply more. So improvisation, um, basically I'm improvising on clothing as a musician would improvise on notes. Um, there's no way to previously rehearse on clothing, um, so what I do in terms of these alterations are really improvised. Once I cut the fabric, there's no way back. In my previous shows, um, I would select the garments that would go through these transformations previously, but in fashion orchestra, um, the performers were actually the ones that chose the garments from a pile of clothing that was on stage, so that their choices actually dictated my improvisation. Um, there's also an aspect of improvisation in this documentation. Um, there are no cuts, this is just, I put the camera on my neck, and there's no, way to know how it's going to film, there's no choice on what it's going to film, it's just, it's just going. Um, and then the last thread guide before going into the needle is 
the idea of participation. So um, Burio discusses the production of relations. He writes that artistic practice is now focused upon the sphere of interhuman relations. So the artist sets his sight more and more clearly on the relations that his work will create among his public and on the intention of models of sociability. So in the studio, um, the participation is a very intimate between the public and myself. The work happens due to this participation. Um, on stage, um, we have been experimenting with audience participation. Uh, so in fashion orchestra, we actually invited the public to come up on stage and dress up um, from that same pile of clothing that was part of the set. Um, this experiment was successful in engaging with the audience However, a question of control became really apparent. Um, suddenly, an audience member began to throw clothes around, and then all of a sudden, a lot of people were throwing clothes all the way up in the air, and I became really, really nervous because of fire hazards, and clothes are very flammable, and there are lights scattered um, around the floor. So um, this question of control, like how can you really, there are no limits when you're inviting audience to come up on stage, there's really no way to know what's going to happen. So uh, at first we were afraid that nobody was actually going to come up on stage and then it just became chaos. Uh, so Claire Bishop writes, the creative energy of participatory practices rehumanize or at least de-alienate a society rendered numb and fragmented by the repressive instrumentality of capitalism. So for the show at Grant Gallery that you all got an uh, invite for, I have put together the two instances of my practice, the studio work and the onstage performance in a full day happening. During the afternoon, the public is invited to bring their own garments, and in the evening I will present a semi-scripted music piece where the public is also invited to try on garments and become a performer. Um, so to fully thread a sewing machine, then you must go through the needle, which is really hard to do when you're nervous. But I think I can do it. Um, the needle is myself. So I feel like I'm stitching the social fabric by bringing different people together, musicians, artists, and just non-artists, just people that want to participate um, and I've noticed how most people when I talk to about my practice they go, oh I have something in my closet that I have been wearing but it's just sitting there I don't know why I don't just get rid of it and then finally they're like, yeah, let's do something with that. So you can do it when you're nervous. Um, so, Miwon Kwon argues that the contemporary artists can be defined as a cultural artistic service provider rather than a producer of aesthetic objects. It is now the performative aspect of an artist's characteristic mode of operation, even when working in collaboration, that is repeated and circulated as a new art commodity, with the artist herself functioning as the primary vehicle for its verification, repetition, and circulation. Um, so, in the past 10 years, I have created a patchwork in Curitiba of these interactions. In the fall, I will be relocating to Germany, where I will intern at a project space called Errant Bodies uh, with artist Brandon LaBelle to research about cultural production in a completely different context than the one that I am familiar with. I'm distancing myself from the fixed studio, and I feel like I'm going full circle back to the exhibitions in progress, where I will aim to engage with different communities in Europe. No, yeah, oh, there it is. So, yeah, that's how you turn on the sewing machine. It is backwards for me, so that's why it's kind of weird to do this, but... <sighs> Yeah. <laughs>
sewing machine and its elements, its parts, that's sort of a metaphor for the various parts of your practice that produce uh, the experience for an audience. And part of it, I was wondering while you were speaking, uh, you know, this machining, machining metaphor seems like it should be inherently limiting. Um, and it's, in a way, it's leaning towards the opposite effect of the, the very free experimental uh, result that's happening. I was like, where, how is this possible? Why is, it, why is this working? Is this like it should work? But then I realized, well, if, if we take the, the, um, the part of the venue, for example, I forget which part you said was the venue. Just this, this thread guy. The thread guy, yeah. okay. So, um, <laughs> I imagine there's a lot of different shapes of thread guides, probably. Yeah, well, they're all pretty much like, the only ones that are thread guides are the tension discs and the lever. All the other ones are just to really just lead the thread through the tension disc right. and the lever. Okay, so let's, let's I'm, I'm curious about, with the example of a venue, um, this is a particular kind of venue, um, is that you I now recognize that you can use this as a means to explore all sorts of different variables, and it's not uh, limiting in the machine sort of way like it seemed at first. So I'm curious, what, how, what sort of venues do you see this um, potentially transforming into and serving? Um, well, I mean, I think tomorrow uh, Grant will be sort of a new experiment um, because I'm not that used to the gallery space, um, or even this was this very traditional theater um, during a very well-known theater festival, and I think the only reason they let me do this is, I don't even know why they let me do this, but I guess it's because I do have a tradition in, in Curitiba, and people know about my work, and um, they want to see it, um, they're curious about it. Um, so I really just see this working in all sorts of venues. Um, from when I first started, like even just taking the sewing machine to a nightclub and just setting up, um, and just this idea of you walking into a place and all of a sudden there's a girl in a sewing machine and you just look back and you're like, this is actually here? And I've had uh, people like, take off their clothes and be like, please, so it's on me. Um, <laughs> so I think there's there's really no limit, and I would like to explore more like other. I guess when I get to Germany, I'm gonna find out these limits um, because in a way in Brazil, um, because there aren't that many rules, uh, or like people don't really follow the rules, and we're kind of allowed to just do these kinds of things, and I. Uh, in Germany, things are not like that. <laughs> but I'm really thinking about trains, actually, as my next sort of idea, is to take the sewing machine on the train um, and just do the traveling and actually have the machine as, as part of the... It's just my, my buddy <laughs> to travel. Across Canada, the train program right now, there's like musicians and artists to travel across the country for free. Really? Yeah. Huh. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, for the, for the plugging computers, right? Yeah. Another question. Hi, Lisa. It's Hi. Luigi back here. Um, great presentation. Uh, really exciting and actually inspirational. And really cool. Am I allowed to say that? Um, I've been sort of working along some parallel threads, uh, in, and I really admire your way of grappling with translating the conditions of musical improvisation uh, into a, I guess you would call it a medium that's kind of counter to what we would think of as live musical improvisation. It's, from my point of view, you've been hugely successful. Um, and in my reading on, on musical improvisation and in readings on uh, improvisation as social practice, which is kind of an emerging field of study, um, something I keep coming across is this notion that in order for improvisation really to exist, it has to have a performative aspect and an engagement aspect with an audience, for, for lack of a better term. Which makes it problematic when you're working in a medium that's normally done in a solitary environment with no one watching. Um, and I've found that difficult to, to grapple with, you know, working frame by frame, picture making by myself. <laughs> it's kind of the opposite of a live music situation. 
Um, could you explain a little bit how you make that link between the live performance, which seems to have really obvious links to musical improvisation, how you make that link back to your studio practice, which I would assume is kind of solitary, not dependent on real-time decision-making, and is kind of counter to what is normally thought of as conditions for true improvisation? Um, good question. Um, but I think my studio is actually a storefront, so I'm constantly being watched. Um, so I guess that really plays a big part in this whole performative and being on stage and, and having that um, sort of flowing with having people doing my work and not even thinking that like I don't notice that people are walking by and looking like I I'm so in the sewing machine and making stuff um, but I notice how other people notice when they come to my studio and they feel a little bit like you know, there's just in an aquarium kind of because it's just like a glass door and it's a pretty busy road. Um, and I think in the beginning when I started wanting to take the sewing machine out um, was a way to connect with people. I was moving to Kurichiba, I didn't know anybody and um, I wanted to socialize and I wanted people to know that they can have their clothes upcycled, that they have, have this option. Um, so, and I started noticing how people are really intrigued by this machine and by the act of sewing um, and just would just stare. Like, I really want to watch as these garments are being made and even like cutting and making something, like physically making something. Um, so I started to develop that idea and to really get the skills to do it really fast and to do it in five minutes. I can transfer into a dress. Um, so I am a very fast seamstress, even when I'm not performing. Um, so I just, I guess one thing is very connected to the other. Like I'm, I'm not normally, like even though sometimes I am alone in the studio sewing, like the, I don't really feel that it is a solitary um, practice. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think so. I mean, for me, it just always leads back to then what are you, what activity are you engaged in if no one is observing you? And I, not really so much what activity, but are you doing the same thing when there's no longer another participant? Um, Would you do the same type of work? I, I think I do because normally I always try everything on, um, even if it's, I'm doing it for somebody else. So I'm always doing that performative, like putting on, like looking in the mirror, seeing if it fits. Um, if like the person's bigger than me, sometimes I'll put on like lots of clothes um, and then put that on top. So, or if the person's smaller, like I'll be like, hey man, I just need to make this tight. And um, just having these skills as a seamstress um, and of trying things on and really fitting it to the body. I can always look at a person and I know what size is going to fit. Like I know exactly what kind of clothing will fit on that person by just experiencing it on myself. So even though it is sometimes solitary, I do still feel that performing. And maybe with this new, uh, the effect of the, the age of prison, we're always being watched. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you.